The year is 1655, and the Netherlands, a small country in the northwest of Europe, is in the midst of a golden age. The tiny nation coordinates the world's largest commercial fleet and is shipping more trade tonnage than all its European competitors combined. In this episode, you will be joining a ship of the VOC fleet to head to the East Indies. Will the reality of that voyage match up with the adventurous journey you have in your mind's eye? Your name is Piet van Westen, and you were born in a small village just north of Rotterdam. You and your two brothers and one sister live on a small dairy farm. Unlike them, though, you've never been satisfied with the daily grind of farming life, the early rises to milk the cows, feed the other animals, clean their living spaces and tending the vegetables, not for you. And then early to bed to start the entire process over and over again. While they stood in the fields, focused with the tasks at hand, you would look off into the horizon, daydreaming at the wonders that lay beyond the flat land stretching far into the distance. You had heard tales about the ships that sailed off to the eastern seas where the weather was said to be sun-filled all year round and the VOC sailors who were able to see firsthand those wonders. You had so many questions. How could the sun shine warm all year round in trees that didn't shed their leaves or people said to be darker than sand? You were obsessed. You were going to find the answer to these questions. You were going to voyage east. These were odd thoughts at first, between farming duties, then an almost constant trickle, a companion to while away the dark, short, monotonous hours of December in the Netherlands. On the eve of your 18th birthday, you gathered the nerve to approach your father to ask permission to join the fleets. His reaction was not anger, but fear, and then scorn, something you hadn't expected. He had heard about parents informing that their sons had not survived the trip. In fact, more accounts of those not surviving than those who had. You pleaded your point that those were just tales to scare others so that those going could hoard the riches for themselves. Besides, you would bring back enough wealth to ensure payments to all your father's creditors. But he would not budge, telling you that if you left, there would be no place here for you to welcome you back. And if you were insistent, well, you would need to leave now. Believing your father would never turn away the riches you would bring back, you packed your belongings, such as they were, and headed north towards Amsterdam. A coach ride through the flat polder farming lands which stretched north as far as you could see, and then a night's lodging at a roadside inn before finally, the next day, seeing the first bricks of Amsterdam's outlying buildings and nestled at its center, the bustling city of Amsterdam. The city you are passing through is full of activity. Merchants on the street side with their organized market stalls, residential areas where many Dutch wives can be seen sweeping fastidiously with their brooms. You then pass through a more densely crowded market area estimating you are several blocks from the Amsterdam VOC headquarters. As you plod slowly through the streets to reach your destination, you are intercepted by a well-dressed man wearing the type of city clothes you would rarely see visiting your small town a few times per year. He introduces himself as Hank and asks where you are headed. You tell him of your desire to sign with the VOC fleet as a sailor helper. His eyes light up and he tells you that your meeting him could not have been more fortuitous, for he happens to represent the VOC's recruitment arm, and he can streamline the process for you and guarantee you a placement on board one of the ships. He tells you that on your own it will be practically impossible to gain a spot with the fleet, but sign with him would ensure placement, all for just a small tributary fee in the form of an IOU. As if sensing your apprehension, he then regales you with wonderful stories of life at sea and the riches to be had in the east, jewels just laying strewn around for the taking 
as were the comely ladies who were everywhere. Not only that, but he would provide you with food and lodgings until boarding time, and provide you with more information on the wealth you'd be bringing back with you at the tail end of your journey, and how to best invest it upon your return. One thing you didn't have packed with you was a plan on where you would be staying until the ships leave in several weeks' time. And here was an opportunity to be given not only placement on board one of the ships, but food and lodgings until that boarding day. All for a fee that you likely would have had to pay anyways for food and lodgings. In addition, he informs you, he will be supplying you with your VOC necessities. Chest, hat, pillow, horse blanket, and a trusty knife. You agree, and after signing are led away to the cold cellar of a nondescript three-story building. You are told of the need to lie low until the day of sailing due to the physical harm possible from those jealous of you and wanting your place on the ship. The food you'd been promised is bland and lifeless, the better to prepare you for the rations on board the ship, he says. And you share the small cramped quarters with dozens of other men, and soon the smells and filth are almost unbearable, but the promise of riches and the fact that these days waiting will soon be over have you surrender to your situation and force each day to bleed into the next. One thing that makes the days quicker is the copious amounts of cheap grog he is plying you all with. You're given so much that the time passes by under a hazy fog and each day blurs into the next. On a chosen set of mornings in December every year during most of the 17th and 18th centuries, Amsterdam was awoken by the insistent blare of trumpets, the shrill of pipes, and a steady yet compelling roll of drums. City folk lined the streets to witness the men shuffling through the narrow brick streets along the canal towards the source of the music. Hapless men, thin and dressed in filthy rags and appearing white from weeks of confinement in stinking attics and cellars, ambled forth. Drunks, derelicts, out-of-work slum dwellers, and dreamy-eyed peasants and farmers. The well-nourished and comparatively tidy-looking men who led this ragtagged group through the streets were known as crimpers, or by the chillingly appropriate name of soul sellers. Their job to provide the VOC with labor for a cut of the laborer's profits, profits which would not be realized for the sailors until journey's end. But the crimpers, upon signing the men and getting them a seat, were given their share. As a result, the prospects were kept guarded under what could be argued were prison-like conditions, locked in cellars and attics, and provided with barely enough calories for a child to survive, let alone a grown man. The deceptively celebratory music and procession really amounted to nothing more than a funeral march for the men being brought towards almost certain death. And the statistics, well, they were grim indeed. A third of the men would not live to see the lowlands of their birth again. The reason many of the men were homeless drunks or dreamers or the most down of the downtrodden was that experienced Dutch seamen were well aware of the low survival rate in the trade to the Indies. And as a result, they preferred to work on fishing boats on ships plying European routes. And even though the conditions on these domestic ships were even more primitive at times than on the East India ships, the shorter voyages and temperate climate gave the sailors a reasonable chance of coming back alive. Compared to even English East India ships, the survival rate on board the Dutch ships was slightly lower. The crimpers and their associates needed to ensure their men made it on the rosters so as to get a cut of that pay. And if that meant keeping them drunk and imprisoned, that's exactly what they did. Finally, the day arrives that you and the others are to march towards the VOC buildings. Your host, Hank, has spent the morning plying you all with a much higher quality of drink than you've experienced these several weeks. Had this been available earlier during your stay, it would have made what felt like a prison sentence slightly more appealing. On standing for the first time this morning, you realize you can barely put one foot in front of the other. 
Hank retells you what he's been telling you and the rest of the men all morning. You are to resort to whatever means to ensure you get in the building and a place on the ship, but not to quarrel with each other. Something doesn't make sense, and you start to question him about this as you had agreed on prearranged spots, but you're simply too out of mental commission at this point to argue. As your shambling and half-dead group approaches the courtyard, you see several desperate men clinging from the windows of a second story and then dropping into the crowd of hundreds more each time the door opens to let another group of men in, many of them breaking limbs and literally smashing their opportunity before it even gets started, only to see more climb up in desperation to take their place. After what feels like hours, you traverse the final 50 feet and have the door open to let you in, barely avoiding one of the men above plummeting down on you and your companions. You are then filed inside and enlisted for the minimum term of five years. Then, your first taste of realism as the fantasy has clouded all else you have seen until this point. The recruiter receives 150 guilders. You knew he would be getting a share, you couldn't quite remember it was that high, and in addition, another 50 guilders for the room and board you had assumed were to be freely given to represent you. However, you've made it this far, so do not dispute any of these points. You are left with approximately 400 guilders that you will only see after the five years is complete. And so, before even starting, you feel for the first time as if you'd been fleeced before even setting foot on the ship. The last two nights in the cellar would be your last in Amsterdam before sailing off with the fleet to the lands you had so often dreamed about. Then the day you've been waiting for arrives. Sight of your first East India ship, and what a sight it is fully three times the length of the largest farm building you'd ever seen, and many, many times the height. You board, passing some of the ship's officers and a large emblazoned VOC logo and crest, down to just one level above the cargo hold into your main crew quarters. While the ship may be three times the length of the largest barn you've ever seen, there are also three times the amount of men crowded into the same space, your farm would hold a single animal. The first thing that assails your senses is the strong smell of musty urine and human excrement, the kind you remember only smelling in the animal pens back home, but dare you say, even worse. The space not only cramped, fetid, and filthy, but gloomy, and you were in an almost constant state of low light visibility as only a tiny bit of daylight made it through the cracks in the hull. The air so heavy the candles, your only source of light, often had trouble burning. Over the coming weeks, seasickness from men unaccustomed to the ocean would only add to the smell and filth with the buildup of their almost constant purging. A few, including yourself, tried to use the designated areas, but you were soon so sick and the purging so frequent that almost any free and open space became a designated area. After a couple of weeks, conditions decidedly worse than the dirtiest pen you'd ever had the displeasure of cleaning. The food, which was horrible the first few days, only got progressively worse. Breakfast, which was served at 7 o'clock, consisted of a grey, lifeless hot porridge cooked with prunes and covered with butter that only got more rancid as the voyage went on. Dinner at noon consisted of beef or pork so salty you couldn't identify fresh from rotten, which you and the others quickly decided was probably for the best. Alternating with the land meat was seafood in the form of dried haddock or hake, served with grey and mushy peas, or beans. You were never quite sure which was which, and tried to hold in your sense of smell to minimize your sense of taste. Then at 6 p.m., finally, supper served, 
which was simply a mixture of leftovers from the two previous meals. To wash it all down, you were provided with your daily grog allowance, which consisted of brandy or rum diluted with water, the effects of which provided almost enough of a haze to make all of the aforementioned meals stay down when the seasickness had subsided. Whether the seamen signed on in Amsterdam, London, or any other European port city, their fate was approximately the same. Life on board the East Indies ships was the definition of filthy, with men packed together in dark and squalid conditions. Vermin, worms, insects, a constant threat to the food stores, and eating them along with the meals became more of a frequent occurrence as the voyage went on. A typical 600-ton East India ship would leave port with roughly 150 men on board, carrying tons of bread, pickled pork, beef, peas, beans, wheat, cooking oil, alcohol, and even some delicacies like cheese, butter, honey, and sausage, but those were meant exclusively for the captain's table. They weren't the regular sailor's fare, and anything fresh like fruit or vegetables on a long journey east was usually gone with the first two weeks at sea. As for the hygiene of the men themselves, well, their clothing swarmed with lice, which carried typhus, and the men constantly were either suffering from dehydration or dysentery, in addition to frequent bouts of scurvy. Every fantasy, every notion you had of the romance and adventure of sailing has been crushed under heel. You are easily the most miserable you've ever been. The farm and your memories of it, small bits of comfort you were able to conjure. While you haven't been seasick for a few weeks, you are still purging almost as much food back up as you're able to keep down. You have gotten used to the smells and sights, but are not sure if that is a good thing as you felt the ability was one of the last things to separate you from the animals you once tended, and now resembled. Your ship soon enters the doldrums, and the heat is becoming unbearable. You are certain you will at some point during this journey meet the same fate as dozens of men around you have already. Death. Surely that would be more merciful than what this voyage has in store for you next.